Oh, hold up. Stand up. Oh, I warned y'all last month. I warned y'all last month when the brown preacher comes up, y'all stay standing. <laughs> Not because of that reason, but because we're going to read the word of God together. If you've noticed at CLB, some preachers like to lead off by just talking straight to you. Uh, for me, I'm like, I want to be hide behind God's word and just give it to you. Does that sound good? So Ephesians 5, we're going to read through this passage that I'll then preach through. Ephesians 5, verse 15, Paul writing to the Ephesian church. So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, so you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, you husbands ought to love your wives as they love their own bodies. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love for himself. For no one hates his own body, but feeds it and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church. And we are members of his body. As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. Church, say amen. Amen. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Jesus and the church are one. So again, I say, each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Thus saith the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for all of the married couples in here, those who desire to be married in singles, and the children in this place. God, would you give us great focus on what you want our attention to be at this morning? Give us a great focus on a singular focus of how to concentrate being the church or Jesus in relationship to one another within marriage. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Go ahead, take a seat now. Take a seat now. Take a seat now. Okay, my married couples, in your thought life, again, key, in your thought life, do not articulate this to your husband or your bride. I want you to rate your marriage from one to ten. One, yeah. One to ten. One is terrible. Five is okay. Yeah, y'all going to act like you aren't going to have ones in this room? Come on, be real. And then on the other side is an amazingly satisfying marriage, and that's at ten. Currently, what is your marriage at right now? I heard someone say, 12, lying is a sin, sir. (laughs) Get this, man. I'm really giving you time to think and come up with a score for a reason. As we go through, I'm going to give you some stats. Continue to think on where you would end up being within your marriage. In 2019, we're going to look at a Pew study that's going to reveal, I think, what most of us married couples already understand. And it is that marriage is difficult. 2019, 9,834 either married people or cohabiting people ended up they ended up sending in a flyer and they answered a bunch of marriage or union satisfaction surveys. And interestingly enough, from the married responses, there are some things that are telling. Only six out of 10, you'll see up here, only six out of 10 believe their spouse will tell them the truth. Only four, y'all, wow, okay, okay, I love it. Only four out of 10 agree with their spouses, believe that their work and their personal life is balanced. Only four out of 10 agree with how, they, how well they communicate. And only three out of 10 are satisfied in their bedroom life. There are so many ways that we could improve our marriages. One moment, you're a bad communicator. So naturally, what do you do? You end up trying to get habits that end up being meaningful and being a better communicator. If you're lousy at actually being fully present, you're going to end up becoming more fully present and setting up behaviors to adjust to. If you're not balancing your personal family life and it's out of whack where your work is taking up all of your time, you're naturally going to end up trying to balance those things. And here's what I suggest, that over the long haul of marriage, 
if you and I spouses continually try to change those little things, we're going to end up being discouraged over the long haul and we're going to end up being weary. And here's why. Here's why. is because it has to do primarily with behavior modification. Behavior modification. Rarely does it actually get to what Jesus sees, and that is the heart. And so, today, Paul gives us husbands and brides one thing to focus on. Church, say one. One thing to focus on. And I suggest that focusing on simply this one thing within your marriage will end up addressing all of the underlying thousands of issues that you have. Let's get into the text. I'm super excited about this. Let's pick this thing apart. Paul's wisdom here. We're going to get into verse 21. Here's that one thing. And further, submit, spouses, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Husbands, your one, husbands and brides, your one focus in your marriage is to submit to your spouse. Your one role is to submit to your spouse. In other words, it's to put your spouse's preferences above your own. To put your spouse's preferences above your own. The original Ephesian readers would have read this as a new born-again Christian in the, Ephes- in the Ephesian church, and it would have been so countercultural. It would have been so different from what the Roman culture was teaching. You see, in Roman culture, first century, women didn't have rights. They were more property. Mutual submission wasn't a thing. It was that brides, because you were female, just had to submit to male headship. But check this out. Paul says, interestingly enough, that marriages who submit to one another, who continually prefer one another's needs over their own, it's actually an act of worship. That is so good news for us. Because in the difficulties of marriage, you may wonder, why am I doing this? What's this all for? I'm weary. And at that moment, Paul's saying, listen, submit to one another. Focus on this one thing, husband and bride, out of worship, reverence to Jesus. So Paul's going to explain real briefly something that's uniquely distinct about submission. Not from cultural definitions, but Paul's literally going to take our passage and he's going to say, okay, you guys got all the premise now? Brides, husbands, submit to one another. But then he actually explains what submission looks like because for a husband, it looks very different than for a bride. And for a bride, submission looks very different than to a husband. In other words, we're going to worship in submission to one another, worshiping Jesus in different ways. Husbands, you're up first. Verse 25. For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. Husbands, your one focus is to love your bride as Jesus loved the church. It's to lay down your life. What does that mean? It's simply, think of it like this. Self-sacrificial love is laying down your life in every facet in your marriage. Love's not exclusively emotional-based, though that's a part of it. But love is all about that action. It's coupled together. And even despite action, love, or despite emotion, love is continually just willing the good of your spouse because of Jesus' willing your good towards us. It is an act of worship. Jesus, by the way, if you're wondering if he ever did something that he didn't feel like doing, the reason why you and I are born again and have been risen to new life is because he did something he did not want to do. Mark. 14 verse 36, Jesus is confessing to the Father. He's going to the cross. And in his humanness, although he was fully and truly God, in his humanness he ends up confessing to the Father, I do not want to go to my scourging. I don't want to carry the cross up to Calvary Hill. And I do not want to suffocate to death in my crucifixion. In all honesty, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and he prays that prayer. And then you end up seeing at the very end he says, your will be done, not mine. He prefers the Father's will over his own. Check it out with me. You'll see it up here. Jesus speaking here. Abba, Father, he cried out. Everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet, for us spouses, especially husbands, when you don't feel like willing the good of your bride, yet, just like Jesus said, yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. Husbands, 
You are to love your bride by laying down your life for her. That's how you submit to your bride. Jesus willingly died for each one of us. Jesus willingly went to the cross despite us being ungrateful, despite us stiff-arming him and not wanting anything to do with him. He died for us when we were messy, sinful, undeserving, and ungrateful. And Jesus ended up going to the cross. And on the way, he was betrayed, lied on, spat on, mocked, and he was brutally beaten. And it was all for people like us. Husbands, in a similar way, when your brides come off as ungrateful or unthankful, that is the time to sacrificially will her good. That is the time for you to react Jesus-like. That is the time that you actually lay down your life. Dare I say, when it's the hardest as Jesus did. Some people, culture will say, yep, you got to man up. I say, you got to Jesus up. Because that, yup, that's what Jesus did. Sometimes you got to look in the mirror or honestly in the middle of conflict with your bride and say, I'm about to Jesus up. Because there is nothing within our old sin nature that wants us to self-sacrifice when it's inconvenient. We got one honest brother up here saying, yep, that's me. Yep. Yep, that's me. And it's not just all reactive. It's proactive as well. You sacrificially love your bride When you plan an extroverted thing, when you're an introvert. When you do a task for your bride that she usually does is, but you'll you'll then end up gifting her by doing it that day. When you take the kids away from your bride. When you commit to something and drop that commitment in honor of your bride. You are proactive when you put her preferences first. I've been married 10 years, and I know that's nothing compared to Bill Springer. I think he's 60 years in. But what I've, I want to caution to us men, us husbands, is don't lay your life down in a way that's not meaningful to your brides. I have done that for 10 years, and I have been so discouraged. We have, we have literally, I have heard over the past 10 years, and my bride is meek, and she is humble. But there's only so much a woman can take, and she's expressed to me difficulties being married to me the past 10 years. And do you know, it... it it actually took me listening for the, it, what seemed like the very first time when she sat down and said, do things that you think would be thoughtful towards me. That I, I'm sorry, that I would really think that is thoughtful, what Roy just did. You see, I, and I'm guessing some of you men have some tendencies where you want to lay down your life in ways where you receive love or you receive respect. And so I've been doing a whole bunch of things over recent years where I'm like, that's so thoughtful. And then when an argument comes up, she ends up saying, you're not thoughtful. And that's not just to pick on my bride. That's just to say, okay, if we're all honest, that's almost every household. Amen? Amen. And I found over the years it's because I wasn't listening. I wasn't actually listening to what things and ever asked her, what are ways I could lay down my life where you would interpret it as me being thoughtful? Husbands, ask the question. Don't waste time. Don't wait a decade like I did. Some of you are 40 years in and it's never too late. Actually ask your brides what is meaningful in laying down your life so that it actually counts in a meaningful way. And if you really think about it, did Jesus not do the same thing, intentional, knew that we could not self-behave and change our behavior to actually be reconciled to God? He had to spill his blood on the cross. That's how we could be made right with God. So he didn't dilly dally and pity pat. He went straight to the cross, died for our sins so that we could believe. Are you tracking with me? He was an intentional God. He knew exactly how to address the issues. And husbands, we can do the same thing when we ask our brides, how can I lay my life down in a meaningful way? That smells a whole lot like humility. And the scriptures end up testifying that God opposes the proud, but gives grace, undeserved favor, To the humble, to the humble, those who have a right perspective of who God is and who we are, a significant God and an insignificant person. Giving up your lives, this is going to be, I'm preaching to the choir husbands, it's going to hurt. Honestly, sometimes it's going to feel like you're dying. But take confidence that Jesus is not asking you to do something that was totally foreign to him. He laid down his life on that cross, Calvary Hill, and suffocated. Let his sacrifice be a motivation for ours. Let his sacrifice be a motivation for ours. 
That's our focused husbands. That's what we were made for. And that is our act of worship. It ain't just singing songs and giving amens here, although that's a part of it. It's responding to God in your marriage. Husbands, if you agree, give me an amen. Amen. Brides, we're going to go here into your focus and see what Paul gives you in your focus. Verse 22, for wives, this means submit, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For a husband is the head of his wife as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, you wives should submit to your husbands in everything. Brides, your focus is to do one thing, and that's to submit to your husbands as you have submitted to Jesus. Submit to your husbands as you submitted to Jesus. Paul uses a marriage illustration to end up comparing the relationship between Jesus and his church. Jesus is represented by us husbands. You brides represent the submissive love of the church in response to Jesus' love. Biblical submission means to arrange yourself underneath. And so as us husbands sacrificially leave, we're arranging ourselves underneath our brides. And yet, and also, you brides are mutually submitting and arranging yourself underneath your husbands. And it's similar to when you first believed, arranging yourself underneath the lordship of Jesus. You practice submission, not to oversimplify it, but you brides practice submission in everyday life. You submit to the local authorities. You submit to your employer, whatever they have to say. For the most part, we follow in line. And within your marriage, the lover of your soul, designer and creator, Jesus himself has ordained for you ladies to submit to your husbands and everything. You've been assigned submission, not out of lack of importance. I want us to grab about four things right here. You've, you've been assigned submission and everything to your husbands, not out of lack of importance. It has nothing to do with your value. Submitting does not mean that you're subservient or you have no value as an image bearer of God. God gave you the assignment to give order within your marriage, just as he has given order in society. And by the way, if you ever wanted to discern if something was godly or not, look into culture, see things that bring order, God seems to be behind that. See things that break down order and chaos, the enemy will be behind that. Submission gets a bad rap. It really does. Even within the Trinity, we worship a God who is one in nature and yet three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The texts in Bible end up saying they all mutually submit to one another. And so you end up seeing the Holy Spirit submit to Jesus and the Holy Spirit submitting to the Father. Then you end up seeing Jesus submitting to the Father. And that does not mean that they're less God. It does not mean that it devalues any of the Godhead's role. It has nothing to do, to do with that. It has everything to do with order, not competency. Order, not competency. Husbands and brides are like pilots of an aircraft. Both of them sit side by side. Both of them are competent to end up taking off and landing. But one of the co-pilots has to defer to the other, either in the taking off or the landing, or else things are just not going to go well. So the co-pilot submits to the pilot as they lead together side by side. Brides, you may find yourself more competent than your husband's. But being a born-again, blood-bought daughter of Jesus had nothing to do with your abilities or your skills. You see, it's about enjoying the role you've been given to represent an amazing thing, the miracle of the church. Think about that. It's not just a group of people that come together, y'all. It's this miraculous work of God's spirit. That people would genuinely, without even seeing, most people not seeing God, believe in him, run to him, allow him to tell us our work ethic, allow him to tell us what we should think and how to raise our children. You represent the church, ladies, and that's an amazing, amazing responsibility. Submission also does not mean about four things that I wanted to share with you. It does not mean that you don't have a voice anymore. But what it does mean when there's a draw on transitions or any decisions in the family that you would submit and allow your husband to make the final decision. 
Submission does not mean that you allow your husband to lead you into sin. Jesus is still your authority. Us husbands are very prone to wander. You ladies know that. Have grace on us. Your ultimate authority comes from the word of God, Jesus himself. Submission does not mean agreeing with everything. Vocalize what you have convictions over. Let your husbands know we need help. There's a reason why Adam wasn't alone. God said that he needed a, a helper suitable for him. He uniquely said, with, this is the first time that's recorded, it is not good for man to be alone. We need you ladies. Submission does not mean submitting to every man, but what it does mean is to submit to your man, your husband, in a marriage relationship. Brides, if you ever have wondered, why do I struggle with this? Is it only me? I want to share with you, there's a freeing answer. And what do you know? It's within the word of God, which addresses everything directly or indirectly. Look at me in Genesis, look with me in Genesis uh, 3, verse 16. Adam and Eve here, the first humans, they just disobeyed God by eating of the fruit of the tree of life. And God ends up giving repercussions. So ever since then, man and women have been reaping what we sown way back then. And here's, there are two repercussions. I want to focus on one. The first one. God's saying here, here's the repercussion to the woman. I will sharpen your pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth. Here's where I want to focus. And you will desire to control your husband. The result of the fall is that women inherited a desire to control their husbands. Throw tomatoes at me, or you could throw it at Genesis when Yahweh spoke. It's the truth. And it's great. Danny... My bride, I love her. She just, just gives me great ammo, not only for sermons, but in life. Um, she told me recently when she had learned about her inherited desire to control within her marriage, it explained a bunch of things. She finally understood while she asked questions like this. Why are you taking this way to the store? Why are you going to park here? Are you really going to eat that? That's not her voice. But it's a nagging voice in my head. That's, that's what it sounds like. Praise God, she does not, my bride does not say those things, but she confessed to me she thinks those things. And for her, <laughs> hey, that's self-control. Give her some props. Brides, you're not the only ones who struggle with control. You're not the only ones. Two things we, you have to simultaneously understand. It's good to recognize that the woman sitting next to you or women in this room, especially who are married, they feel you. They understand your same struggle. And number two, it's even greater to understand that it is a repercussion from the fall of humanity. In other words, it is sin from your old sin condition. What Jesus ended up dying for, that's a part of it. And what he wants you to do in your marriage relationship is to continue. I say continue because we know that that's the exact exhortation that Paul has. Continue to put to death sin. So repenting of the moments that you want to control within your marriage, honestly, may be the one focus you have to worship Jesus and obey him within your marriage. Continually repenting of the urge to control things. And if this sounds difficult, it's because we all know that it is. (laughs) But God. God has given every person who has repented and believed in Jesus his Holy Spirit. The spirit of truth, the spirit of empowerment, the Holy Spirit who comes with a new nature and new giftings and new rewirings. The Holy Spirit of Jesus has come to your front door. Verse 18, read with me. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with With the Holy Spirit. This is written right before we end up getting our focuses from Paul on our marriage. Interestingly enough, he gives us an exhortation, be filled with the Spirit. And the first application is not so that you would go to your workplace and end up worshiping there. It's not that you would come to church and worship here. It's that you would go home and worship Jesus as a husband and bride. That's mind-blowing to me. I may be reading into it. But it smells like importance. It smells like practicality. In other words, Paul's emphasizing that being filled continually with the spirit of the living God is essential 
for us to have an enjoyable marriage, for us to increase the score that we gave earlier and how our marriages are really doing. Why is the question I always ask on some of this stuff. When you're filled with the spirit of God, you have less of yourself and more of God. When you have more of Jesus' nature, you have less of your old sin nature. Be filled with the spirit of God. So the question has to be, how are you going to do that, pastor? Verse 19, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourself, making music to the Lord with your hearts, and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Getting into the word, singing songs of worship, meditating and cherishing God's word, thanking God once in a while outside of breakfast, lunch, or dinner is how we get filled with the Holy Ghost. In other words, to put it really simply, spiritual habits is where God is going to fill us, where we're overflowing with his fruit. Timothy, Paul writes to Timothy and says, have nothing to do with old wives' tales. Have nothing to do with myths and old wives' tales. Instead, train yourself to be godly. It ain't, you ain't going to just wake up. I ain't going to just wake up. And just be so godly that my bride is like, I thank you, Jesus, for this man. That just doesn't happen. It comes from pursuing God and spiritual habits. My coach used to say, and it's redundant, but I L-U-V this saying, first you form the habit, then the habit forms you. First you form the habit. We've got one brother saying amen. Then the habit forms you. If you've ever tried to cuss out your spouse while listening to worship music, it's impossible. <laughs> It's impossible because if you have tried to cuss your spouse out while lit, right after your quiet time, a little bit more possible. But while you're listening to worship music, is difficult. So as you find moments to connect with God, it will be the Holy Spirit who gives you joy, peace, and power and delight in your marriage. Husbands and brides, your intimacy with the Holy Spirit is the, not a, the indicator of how well you enjoy your marriage. To put it simply of how much that number goes up and down in scoring your marriage success. Church, we don't just, and I mean just, we don't just need marriages that last longer than people who are not born again. We don't just need that. We need spirit-filled marriages so we can bear fruit. Spiritual fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self can control self-control and as you pursue the spirit in your own time and go vertical just see how God ends up blessing your children your children's children your great-grandchildren your neighborhood and especially those marriages that are suffering silently just by pursuing the spirit and focusing on our roles right now I want everyone to stand up please as the band comes up want to pray for those who are married this morning. And then I want to pray for those who are single. So Jesus, I thank you so much for ever here in this room this morning. God, you know exactly the pain points in the hearts of brides and husbands here. You know those who have been divorced and those who are currently in the process of getting divorced. God, God keep our hearts soft. Keep our hearts soft towards you and towards one another in our marriages, that we would mutually submit to one another, prefer one another's needs over our own, and that it would be delightful because we're seeking you and honoring you. Thank you that you're the God of order. Thank you that you give value to every image bearer. And God, I'm asking specifically that you would bless all the marriages that in this room with uh, fruit where children would come to know you and love you. And that the seed of faith would be given to them so that they would pass it on, God. You're worthy of not just worship in this generation, but the generations to come. So every child in this elementary room, or (laughs) that was in elementary, that are here now, God, save them. Fill them with your spirit. Help them recognize the spiritual gifts you've given them to honor you and serve others in. And for those who are single, for whatever reason, God, I'm asking that if they have a desire to be in union and in a covenant marriage one day, Would you provide that spouse? 
but would you provide the best spouse you can for that person? Would they seek you and pursue you and see you fit to honor you by seeking purity within relationships? And for those who are content in singleness, God, thank you for the gift that that is to them. Would you continue to give them opportunities to experience you as companion, to experience you as husband? And would they serve you with all their heart in unique ways? Let's go. In Jesus' name, amen.